Uh, we're going to talk about access control, which is kind of a fundamental thing that security systems need to provide. So what is this? Uh, access control is synonymous with authorization. And it's kind of the simplest thing we can teach right now uh, in security, which is why it's often delivered first. And this is uh, access control just defines who can perform which actions on what resources. And this consists of four components. Uh, the first is identifying the subjects that can participate in this system. So who are, who, is the, who are the folks who are doing these actions? Uh, the next is all the resources in your system that you're trying to protect. So those are the objects. The third thing is what are the operations that you are allowing in that system? So what are the like read, write, append, modify, uh, rename, you know, a lot a very rich set of things that you could do. Uh, could be specified as potential operations. And then the last thing are the policies. And the policies are the rules that determine which operations a particular subject can do on particular objects. So it ties them all together. Uh, these are specified as permissions. And permissions are usually defined as a combination of the object and the operation that you're trying to specify the rules for, and then you assign those permissions to subjects. That's common in, in security. So those are the four main things. And you know, there's all different types of computer security systems out there. For the access control part, this, it boils down to these things. Um, and we'll talk about the different styles. I'm not gonna be very exhaustive because there's a ton out there, but uh, we'll just cover some of the more common ones. Uh, in any security system or in any computing system, the security policies are enforced by something we call a reference monitor or sometimes a guard. Someone has to do the checking. Like maybe if it's like, so in, in the physical sense, there's a security person in the city of Portland building, typically they're checking, right? Uh, who are you? What's your business here? Oh, you're a student? Yeah, you can go over there to Portland state side. Uh, and so, well, if it's always working, they're always checking. Um, an example that you're probably familiar with is the Linux kernel or an operating system. Uh, so embedded in the operating system in the Linux kernel, there is a guard. Uh, and the guard's uh, job is to take accesses from user space. So in this case, a particular Linux user. And the Linux user is going to interface with the operating system using system calls or C library calls. And then something in the kernel is gonna be like, well, do you have access to that? So maybe I'm trying to open Etsy password, right? And I'm just a mere, you know, unprivileged user. And uh, someone has to say, no, you can't do that. And that's the Linux, that's the guard inside the Linux kernel that is the monitor that is implementing that security policy. And so this guard, not only does it have to make sure you the principal is who they say they are, but then uh, based on after authentication, it has to go check the policies. And that's what the authorization module is about. So what are the policies that, that mediate this access by this person on this with this particular action on a particular object? And then based on these two things, you can say, all right, yeah, you, you can go ahead and perform that action or it'll be denied. We don't have the deny part on here. And then potentially you'll have an audit trail, a log. And we'll get to audit trails and why they're important when we talk about forensic activity, like if stuff breaks or like maybe you're sharing the administrator account across like five or six different people and somebody does something out of that five that blows up the system. Well, then you need an audit log to say, okay, this is what happened. So we'll talk about that later. Uh, so how are these permissions and policies stored? Uh, well, first we're gonna talk about what is stored and typically what is stored is known as an access control matrix. Um, and so logically, uh, when you represent this, you'll see it represented in a table 
And uh, across the columns of that table are the actual objects you're trying to protect. So in this case, maybe it's a bunch of files in the file system going across the top uh, as rows. And then uh, along uh, for each row, you have all of the subjects. So the objects are at the top, subjects are on the, uh, are, are here as rows. And then the permissions are specified as uh, these fields inside. Okay, so those, uh, that's typically how we represent this thing. And uh, so this is an example for the Linux access control matrix. Uh, at the finest granularity, however, this matrix is enormous. And so if you take the cloud class, you'll see that in one of these cells, there's like 3000 permissions. There are 3000 different kinds of operations you can specify. And then for the objects, there are thousands of objects or resources in a cloud project that uh, you wanna protect access to. And then based on the size of your organization, the number of rows could also be large. So how are you supposed to specify a security, an access control matrix that is secure when you got so many things to look at? And uh, one of the things that is going on right now is that this matrix is so huge, we need automation <laughs> and we need formal methods and we need uh, sort of mathematical foundations in order to really figure out whether or not a particular setting is secure or not. And that's kind of a preview, maybe not for this class, but for like real life when you get out there and you realize like, oh gosh, I have an AWS project and I have a million permissions to manage then you're in trouble. Uh, organizations are in trouble. Uh, so we're going to talk about, well, if we have to have this matrix, how do you store it? Uh, so there are two different options uh, that you typically come across. You can store it as an access control list or an ACL or as capabilities. And this basically is the difference between storing columns or storing rows in a system. So what is the what are these things? The first is an access control list. Uh, and so in this case, you have objects and then you store the permission policies next to the object. So if it's in a file, then maybe the file metadata has the permission policy on that. Okay, so that's what this is a picture of. So home Bob documents has all of the permissions for particular users uh, that are on the system. And based on those users, you can allow certain accesses, okay? Uh, one of the, the, the benefits of this is that it's easy to audit for a particular resource who has access, right? I can just go to that file and it's all there. What's really difficult is uh, what happens if I have a suspicious user and I wanna delete that user's access from my system? I basically have to traverse the entire matrix, right? Like, if I want to delete Bob from the system, uh, I have to basically go and do an exhaustive search in all of the potential places Bob has access to, which is, you know, not, not such a happy thing. Uh, this is basically what the Linux file system is doing. Uh, those permissions are associated with that file, and then you can see what those permissions are by just looking at the file. Okay, and in particular, Linux is only doing three operations. So each one of these cells, so you have, a, you have a, an object and within each one of these cells, you basically just have read, write and execute. Um, there's some other ones, but they're very, they're very rare. Okay, uh, the other way to store this is with capabilities. So you identify the subject and you attach all the permissions that that subject has on your system along with that subject. Right, so if a subject is doing something on the system, then the reference monitor, the guard, can go look up that user and see if that action is allowed on that user's capability list. Okay, so this has got a you know the flip set of trade-offs. It's harder to protect particular objects, right? If I want to figure out who has access to uh, Home Bob documents, I have to go through all the users. <laughs> and then say home Bob documents, home Bob documents. So that's a, that's a pain, it's the opposite thing. Uh, but it's easy to tell what an individual subject has access to. So if I do wanna delete Bob from the system, I just delete the capability. I delete that row and, and I'm done. 
you will find capability systems uh, in cloud projects. So cloud IAM uh, often has capabilities associated with, in this case, roles or sometimes users. Uh, you'll see the new way of doing authorization that like this for federated identity providers like social sign on and these sorts of things. This is done in OAuth 2 and SAML. So when Portland State um, does the authentication, it gives you this SAML token that tells the destination what you might have access to. And so your capabilities are sent along with your SAML token in this case. And um, I don't really talk about SAML in this class or OAuth 2, but I do talk about this in the cloud class. Uh, know that that's mostly a capability system. And this is where we're actually going because when we're talking about distributed identity providers and being able to do accesses on third-party services for a particular identity, like by definition, you have to like associate the permissions with the person because the person is going to a different service and there's resources everywhere. It's just impractical to do it any other way. Um, so it's a capability system. Uh, Linux has started to adopt capability systems inside of the kernel. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Linux file capabilities uh, when we get to it. And it's a way of reducing privileges on access. So uh, this will come, uh, when we talk about privilege, privilege escalation and the issues that the Linux security model has with it. One of the ways to fix that is to add capabilities to files, not necessarily to subjects, but to particular uh, programs. Uh, so that's something. And then uh, Linux SecComp is a module you can optionally add into uh, your Linux operating environment. And that is also a capability list that specifies which system calls does this program have access to? Right, so like if this program should never do a fork or an exec, well, then I can specify that as capabilities attached to the process. So you'll see these things come up even in a in, even in a system that does access control lists. Well, maybe some part of their permission policy is done as capabilities. So it's kind of a mix and match uh, thing. Are there any questions about ACLs and versus capabilities? Okay. Uh, hopefully that's clear. Uh, I am going to talk about now some common options for building access control systems. Uh, and these aren't mutually exclusive. These are different ways of, of constructing your access control system, of designing it. Uh, and then I'll point to the actual places where, where you might come across these things. Uh, so these are the four things I'm going to talk about. The first is building your access control system based on uh, attributes, system-defined attributes. And so the idea here is you have a list of subjects and you attach descriptive attributes to those subjects. So in this case, Alice is a wizard. So the wizard uh, flag on Alice's uh, user is, is set to true. And then you have Bob here at the bottom who uh, is a student and uh, uh, he has his attributes set to true. And then on the object side of it, you have objects that also are labeled with these attributes. And you know, in this case, they're labeled with the same attributes that the subjects are labeled with, but they don't necessarily have to be. Um, so in this case, you have a spell book that you only want wizards to access. And then you have notes that you, you want students to access. And then this is like the simplest attribute based access control system. Then you have some kind of access policy and the access policy in this case is trivial. The attributes have to match in order to allow access. Uh, and then uh, this system can, can be quote unquote secure. Okay. Uh, in practice, attribute based systems are extremely rich. So you have all sorts of subject attributes. So the role that the subject is playing, the security clearance of the subject, uh, maybe the geographic location of the subject. Uh, very rich user analytics could be used as attributes in this, in, a, in, a, in this kind of system. And then you have the resource and action attributes. So maybe the file creation date, maybe who created the file, maybe the data sensitivity level. So if you've labeled the, the object with a, with a clearance level or a, an access level, maybe it has that. 
Uh, and then you also have environmental attributes. What's the situational awareness of the system? What's going on? Am I being actively attacked or not? Should I be locking the thing down more aggressively or not? So these are environmental things that you might consider. Uh, and then based on all of these attributes, you would then have a policy that would say, take all these attributes, and then based on these settings that I've collected, uh, then you have an authorization engine that says, do you allow this or do you deny this? So this is a much richer way of doing security that's more um, in real time. Um, and so it's no, it's no surprise that as we've evolved security systems, we're moving towards this, right? Uh, we are moving towards something which I'll cover later on in this class called zero trust architectures with continuous step up authentication. So what does this mean? This is a bunch of gar this is all buzzword stuff. Uh, this means that your authentication level and your authorization level is never fixed. It means that I'm going to collect this stuff in real time. And is it, if it looks like you're doing something suspicious, maybe you're, it's out of the ordinary, I'm going to do something called step up authentication. I'm going to force you to like, if you have a YubiKey, plug that thing back in and touch the touch the, the YubiKey, and I'll cover YubiKeys in two weeks. But I'm going to force you to do something to show that you are who, who you say you are, to basically update your attributes so that I have higher trust in you. So that's, that's an idea. And then this, because this is so rich, uh, this is being trained using machine learning models. This is one of the hot areas in security. And this is where I, I mentioned my former student who didn't finish her master's degree because she joined, joined Silence. That's basically what Silence was doing. Uh, continuous authentication, user profiling to say, this is the profile of this particular person and how they interact with the system. I'm gonna build that profile, I'm gonna learn it. And then if I see deviations, I'm gonna do a step up authentication. And that's a, uh, that company got acquired by BlackBerry and I forget that they rebranded the name of the product, but Persona, that's what it's called. Uh, is their product. And they're making a bunch of money off of that. Um, and Google's got the same thing, although they don't, pro uh, they're productizing that in their cloud offerings, but that's all, that's all boiled into this thing called zero trust. Um, okay. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is mandatory access control. This is used in high security military and government systems. And it's used to mediate the, the accesses between users and resources. Uh, so with mandatory access control, you typically are using it in conjunction with some form of attributes. So in this case, what you'll commonly find is you'll have clearance attributes for subjects. And if you ever work for the federal government, you'll have to apply for particular clear clearance levels, at least in the NSA. And then they'll do background checks. They'll call me, say, hey, was that student in your class? I'm like, I think so. Uh, hopefully I know your name and your face. That would be ideal. Like uh, if I look, so definitely for graduate students who work with me, I'll get the call. Uh, what's this person, uh, uh, what's the history of this person? And then you get these clearance levels, you know, unclassified means you don't have anything all the way to the top secret. Uh, and then you have a similar labeling with everything that you're trying to protect. Uh, so military secrets or, Government secrets, that's all, that's all labeled on the right. Uh, the key to this is that those attributes are assigned by some system or some agency or, or uh, some authority, not by the users itself. And this is why, um, um, so users have no discretion to either set these attributes or alter the permissions on the objects that are in the system. And so I use this no discretion because this is what differentiates mandatory access control with discretionary access control, which is basically what you have right now with Linux. And we'll cover that uh, at the end. Uh, so once you have these attributes uh, labeled, then you have to define some rules uh, in order to mediate the user access to the objects and you need to mediate this in a way that meets your security goals. You remember those security goals from last class? You have to figure out what's important to you. Confidentiality, integrity. 
And if those are the things that you care about, well, you need some formal model that generates a policy that meets those things. And that's what we're going to talk about uh, next. Uh, well, eventually, later on in this class is what we'll talk when we'll talk about that. Uh, so that's it. And you see the, you know, you, this this access is being denied uh, because the rules say so. Okay. Uh, another form of access control you'll come across is role-based access control. And the idea of this is to associate permission policies with tasks rather than with subjects. Uh, so if you identify a set of tasks that need to be performed by a particular role, then you would attach these, uh, these permissions to that and then assign that role to particular subjects. So for example, you have some software that is controlling your CICD pipeline and it needs access to your Git repository. It needs access to your test uh, virtual machines that you've, you deployed in, on AWS uh, or so. And then you, but you have like different pieces of CICD software that you have purchased. And each one of those pieces of software needs to have a particular set of permissions that are all shared that are the same, right? for that operation. And so the idea would be is like, well, I'm gonna use a level of indirection here. I'm gonna say all CIDC, CICD software has the Git pull, the, the, uh, the virtual machine deploy or virtual machine editing functionality. And I would assign that to a role. And then each piece of software is allowed to take on that, that role and assume those permissions. So that's the idea. Uh, and I wish I, I probably should have, shown the figures uh, before I just uh, said all of that stuff. Uh, but this is what goes on uh, in role-based access control. You have a set of permissions and you have a set of roles. Well, you, you first say, you define the, the roles first. You're like, hey, this is what this particular role needs to do in my, in my system. What permissions does it need? And so in this case, it needs to be able to change a whole bunch of settings on the project. So I have to define uh, those permissions. And if you take the, um, the cloud class, this is one of your exercises, actually. It's like, hey, you know, I have a role, I have an application that has this particular need. Well, what's the set of permissions? What is the minimal, the least set of privileges that that thing needs to work? That's what this operation is. I have this role, what is the least set of permissions that it needs to do its job? And you'll do that for a whole bunch of roles on your project if you're if, if you care about security some people don't care about security and this is like owner 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 and then you're in trouble and i've seen that so so in fact this is bad because like if you're if you're a developer like most of you are in the cs program like if you're a developer and you look at the tutorial the tutorial is like yeah don't don't worry about the security settings this is just yeah make it owner or make it editor and then just be done with it. The problem is, is that that code ends up in production eventually, and those those permissions, and then your hose, because then you, then this is this is really hard. Okay, so that's that's the uh, that's the assigning of permissions to a role, and then what happens is these roles get assigned to subjects. Uh, so system administrators could be a role, or developer could be a role, uh, and and so on. And so this level of indirection is really helpful because if I have a hundred different developers, I'm like, I would have to store those permissions and update those permissions individually, developer by developer. Instead, what I can do is I say, you know what, this is the set of permissions for a developer. Let me just add and delete developers, uh, attach developers, to particular developer roles, and then that's that's how I can manage the, the security uh, of that. Okay. Uh, so there are two parts to, to an RBAC system that must be performed really well by the administrator. The first is the user role assignments. So I have to uh, uh, manage the mapping of, of users to roles, and I have to keep that thing up to date. And I have to make sure when a particular user leaves the company, I delete that, that assignment. Uh, you, there are many cases where that hasn't happened uh, and has led to a disaster, especially if you a disgruntled employee, say you have to fire someone and they have, a, they have access to your cloud project. 
if you haven't completely deleted that person out of a cloud project, and it's really easy to hide, as it turns out, inside a cloud project, it's easy to hide access going into one of these things, then you're in trouble. Um, so this, this is really important. Uh, the other thing that's really important is making sure this assignment is actually with least privileges. And so if that operation isn't done uh, correctly, then you also have backdoor accesses that, that, that people can uh, leverage. Okay, and this is why uh, security people make a lot of money because nobody really wants to do this. Like this is kind of hard, hard work, uh, but that's, that's what needs to be done. So this is commonly found in the cloud. Uh, and if you are looking to secure the cloud, this is the kind of auditing and uh, hygiene that you have to get good at. Okay. The last thing I want to talk about is discretionary access control, because this is something that you are probably most familiar with uh, if you've used Linux or you have your own laptop. Um, and so these are things, these access control policies are enforced by the system, but it's usually at the discretion of its users. Uh, so in this case, anytime you as a user create something, so exam for example, I create a file in the file system, uh, then basically you are allowed as the creator of that file to also specify the permission policies uh, for accessing it. So this is at your discretion, you get to set the security of the things that, that you create. So that's, that's Linux. Okay, so those are, that's your brief overview of uh, access control systems and kind of the categories. Uh, you have any, any questions or? Yeah. So it would depend on where you are deploying your CI/CD pipeline. Um, but, but if it is in the cloud, uh, part of deploying these products into the cloud would ask you to assign permissions, some kind of IAM role. If you're deploying this on your laptop, you're basically giving it root permissions. And we'll talk about it's, you, it's like if there's a bug in the CI/CD software that you're running and you've given it root permissions, then the CI/CD software could put a backdoor on your system because you're trusting it and you've installed it, and that has that is a an attack vector which we'll actually talk about because I there is a section later on in this course about uh, uh, supply chain uh, security. That's one of them. So like you know there's uh, there's gremlins in your VS code like if you. If you're like, oh, I love this extension, uh, like it does really nice, you know, rust highlighting. Rust is the new hotness. And then that thing, if it hasn't been vetted, is actually got things to, to like steal your AWS secrets out of your project. Uh, that's what you're looking at. Because if it gets installed with root permissions, which most of us are doing, you're like, yeah, get, just give it access to whatever it needs access to. That's the issue. Now, the place where, where this thing is done right is phones. Right now, phones are like, you're installing stuff as your own user. And if you need access to particular devices, I'm gonna give you individual prompts to say, hey, give me access to location, give me access to microphone. Uh, that type of granularity doesn't exist for CI CD software. You install it and it like, hey dude, I need root. I'm like, I'm gonna, or, or do that, I'm sorry, I don't want to be gender here, but I need access to your uh, root file system. And then you're like, okay, sure. I need to get the work done. And then there you go. Um, so, okay. Um, the next thing I want to talk about are our models for access control. So those are techniques for doing it. Uh, this is probably the most dry part of this course. Uh, so if you can get past this, you're like, I think you're doing good. Um, I'm going to talk about security architecture models, and this is about specifying policies uh, that describe the system, the subjects, the objects, the actions, and the permissions in a way that you can guarantee your security goals are met. And I referred to this earlier. I need this thing to be have confi uh, support confidentiality. 
I need this thing to support integrity. Uh, and so that's, that's the idea. Uh, and I need these models to be proven correct and complete. Uh, and so this is more of the formal aspect of security. Uh, some of these models and the ones that we'll be covering are the first two, this Bell La, La Padula and this Biba integrity model. Uh, there are other models that people have proposed and analyzed and they might be uh, used, uh, but these are behind the scenes uh, models. And so I am going to gloss over this intentionally because I think if you get, if you get this too much, you're gonna be like, wow, I don't really like security. And then you'll stop do doing security. But if I don't teach this and you go out in the world and you don't know what these concepts are, uh, no employer is going to take Portland State seriously, or the Portland State Security Program seriously. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to introduce the high level idea of these things. Uh, and then when someone mentions it, you're like, oh, yeah, I kind of I kind of know what that stuff does. And then if you work in government or in a highly a high secure uh, environment, then I would suggest getting a book and then just, yeah, biting the bullet and reading about these models and to be able to speak to them. Okay. So the first thing is the Bell La Padula confidentiality model. And this is a formal model for ensuring confidentiality when you have security roles and objects that are hierarchical and well-defined. This means that someone has taken great pain to label the subjects and label the objects, and then can build a strict model for mediating access between them that guarantees confidentiality. Uh, so that's what we're, we're looking at. Um, and, it's, and it's really specifying allowable communication between subjects and objects in the system, okay? Um, so it, it targets the control of information flow so that you can remain confidential at all times. Um, and so this is typically used in government and military systems. There is this famous orange book that is like the Bible for this. And it hasn't been updated because it's actually correct. All right, and this was done in the 60s. And so if you want a high secure, uh, highly secure system, you would just, everyone cites the orange book uh, because the NSA knew what they were doing uh, when they wrote it. Um, so some examples of uh, this kind of thing. Um, so I don't know, have you ever seen these two photos or this photo, it actually is a blow up. This photo and a blow up this photo. This is just like from three weeks ago. I think it's three, no, this is like last month, sorry. Time warp. So what are these documents from? Yeah, this is Mar-a-Lago. So this is what they found in, in Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate. And you can see clearly this thing has been labeled, right? Top secret slash SCI. So this reveals the mandatory access control system that the government has in place to ensure confidentiality. Now, the fact that this now exists now you have to, uh, because confidential, I mean, there are some rules, like in an electronic system, if you can enforce all of those rules, you can guarantee confidentiality. If you could enforce these in real life, you could also guarantee confidentiality, assuming you trust the users at particular security levels. But when the top secret, when the person with the top secret security clearance uh, can't be trusted, then you have something like, like this. To, and so now this is all, this is not confidential, uh, not confidential, but it's not because the model didn't work. It's because the rules were violated um, in this case. Okay, so what? Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about labeling systems and what makes this model work. Uh, the first thing is that you have uh, two kinds of labeling. Uh, the you have labeling of the subject and then labeling of the, the actual information. So subject and object labeling based on level of trust. Uh, and so with labeling of the objects, you have these levels, top secret, secret, confidential, and unclassified. You could have a much richer set, which is what uh, uh, some of these government ones do. Yep. Yeah, this, uh, I need to build up this, uh, the definitions and the labeling. <laughs> 
And then I'll talk about Bell and La the, the formulation of Bell and La Padula that I'm going to show you is going to use this as a an example. Yeah, this is a little more general, um, but I, yeah, I need to define this uh, with actual labels so that I can then define the model, the security rules uh, that govern this particular model. And so you have labeling of documents uh, at particular levels of sensitivity. Uh, and then you also have some set of categories and these are unordered. So you could say, well, this is a class of categories that deals with covert agents, or this is a class of uh, documents that deal with nuclear weapons, or a class of weapons that deal, or a class of uh, uh, documents that deal with breaking cryptography. And so those are categories that, and they can overlap, like you could have a document that's both. Um, and so that's, that's what, what this is. So we're going to say that we have some categories that are just, just a set of interest groups, and then we have these uh, sensitivity levels as labels. Okay, so that's, this, is, this is on the document side. Uh, and then we're gonna have a labeling of the subjects via their clearance levels that are, that are aligned in this formulation with those documents. So similar to that attribute-based things where the, the labels on the subjects and the label on the attributes align. That's basically what we have in the government. We have labels on the documents, top secret, unclassified, that map to subjects. On the uh, on the other side, you know, top secret clearance, uh, secret clearance, and those sorts of things. Uh, we also will have specified which category of document a particular subject should be able to see. So, if I'm a cryptographer, I better only able, I better only be able to see the crypto documents, right? Like, I shouldn't be able to access. So, if I have secret clearance. And I'm a cryptographer. I should only see the the cryptography documents and not the nuclear, the nuclear documents that are top that are secret. So there are both. There are two things here: your security clearance level and what what you should be able to look at, or what category of document you should be able to look at. Yeah, it's a need to know. I should put that there. On the need to know basis is what that is. Uh, the category. Um, uh, is going to lie. how much do I trust you and then do you need to know uh, those are the two things uh, when you label the subject you're using similar labels as you are labeling the documents with you're basically saying this is the security level and this is the category or categories that that particular person has access to so in this case this is a if you attach this to a subject they got nothing right unclassified documents and not only that uh, well, maybe documents that, that don't fall under any category this person has access to. This is the minimal, this is the lowest level of clearance level or clearance uh, for access. Okay. So the label, so assuming this labeling, this generic, uh, this, this, this uh, kind of labeling is being done, then uh, you need rules now. Okay, I have, the, I have this, which subjects should be able to read things, uh, confidentiality, and then what should subjects be able to write, if anything? Uh, and that's what this model is about. So the Bell La Padula confidentiality policy is this. You can't read up, that makes sense, but you also can't read down, okay? So the subject, if you are, for example, in your secret clearance level, you can't read top secret, that's obvious, but you also can't write Confidential, confidential documents or unclassified documents. That's the, that's the core, like in a picture, that's what the model is. Now there's some math here and uh, the, the, the notation that is being used uh, to define this uh, is, is in two properties. There is a simple security property and a star property. Uh, that, so the simple security property is the no read up. So you have a subject with a clearance level, L sub S, and a set of categories that they're allowed to know about. And you have an object, and that object also has a clearance level and a category or a list of categories. You can only allow this to happen if the clearance level of the subject dominates or is, is, is higher than that of the object, right? So you can read down, that's fine. 
uh, and you can't read up, but also if the categories of the object are a subset of the categories the subject is allowed access to. So that's the other thing. I have to be able to access all those categories in that document, otherwise it's like, no. Uh, even though that's even though I have crypto and it says nuclear and crypto, I can't access that because I, I don't know, I'm not allowed nu nuclear as, as a category. So that's the idea. Uh, the other one is a little counterintuitive. This is the no write down policy or the star property. The subject with that clearance level is allowed write access to an object only if the subject level is less than the the objects uh, level and the categories are a subset of that object so the higher levels can't write documents in lower but the lower can write into the higher so think about that like why is why would you why would you allow that uh i mean that that is counterintuitive so what this does is that this prevents someone or a process with a high security clearance from leaking information into the lower security clearance levels, right? So if I have, like, I have a computer, I'm in top secret, I wanna be able to, to ensure that I'm not able to write out low, clear, uh, low security clearance documents. Because if I was an insider and I wanna, like, maybe I'm a whistleblower, I mean, this kind of prevents whistleblowing, uh, like, I am going to copy that file into a secure, security clearance level that my mole has got, and then that person's going to walk out with the papers. So it prevents that flow, that information flow downward uh, is the idea. Um, uh, it is okay for lower clearance levels to write up though, right? So say I'm a, an informant, and I'm going to give you sensitive information, I, I have no security clearance, right? And then, but I'm gonna write a document and push it up that's highly sensitive, and then it's gonna be able to be written into a higher security clearance level, right? And this, uh, this, isn't, this is confidentiality that we're trying to protect, not necessarily integrity, but if you care about integrity at the same time, you'll vet the identity of the source of the writing, and you'll be able to identify that as being written out by someone with lower clearance uh, level. So that's the idea. Are there questions about this at the highest the highest level, yeah. Uh, so the first case is that you go from a lower level to a higher level, so you won't be able to read the file back. Yes, that is correct. Yeah, so yeah, they'll write the file and then they no longer have access to it, um, would, would be the idea. But that's okay, because they wrote it. Unless you're like me, and I write something, I'm like, did I really write that? Like, like <laughs> the next week, <laughs> like, I guess I did. Like, you have it in my email, or, or it was in my email. So then you're like, okay, yeah. I did write that, unless you hacked my email and then you wrote it and tricked me. Okay, so this is something like, uh, this could probably be in a final exam, just, just saying, uh, because one of the course objectives and the reason why I have to teach this, I don't really wanna teach these models, but I have to because it's in the course objectives. And so like, if I were to, to give you an exam and ask you uh, about this, this might be an example I would ask you about is like, hey, I have a subject with this clearance as a secret clearance level, and I have a category access to crypto, and then I have these objects, these four objects, A, B, C, and D, and these are its levels, confidential, uh, top secret, secret, and then these are the categories of these documents. Uh, which ones would I have access to? I'll give you like, uh, I like for you to solve this on your own before I give you the answers, uh, and hopefully you're not looking at the slides already. Uh, don't look at the answer. <laughs> Try and figure this out on your own, and then I'll walk through it. So I'll just take just take a couple minutes. Go one by one and say yes or no. Um, but yeah, I'll give you a minute.
Okay, so what objects can this subject read? Uh, so it can obviously not read the top secret one, B. You can eliminate that. Uh, but it basically, out of the rest, it can only read, it can't read C because the, lab, the categories don't match. It can't read D because crypto is just a subset of the object categories. And so really the only thing that uh, is completely uh, dominated by the subject's clearance is the confidential with the crypto. So it's just A, okay? So not D because the categories of the subject don't dominate the categories of the object. And that's where this notation, um, this notation that I had before, this, both of these things have to apply. Okay, are there questions about that? The, why, why it is the way it is. Okay. Uh, what objects can the subject write? So this is the, the star property. I'll give you another 30 seconds and I'll let you answer it. Or did you have a question? No, You're gonna answer it? Okay, I'll give you 30 seconds and then you can give the answer. <laughs> And I wish I had put the formula. In fact, I'm going to write a note. The formula should be on the side here. Because otherwise, you're flipping back in the slides to figure out what those formulas were. Uh, make a note to myself. Except I don't have a pen. Oh, well. I hope I remember when I get back to my office to make that change. <clears throat> Okay, so what objects can, can... You can write the B, because you can write up, but you can't write down, so it eliminates A. B is on the way to the object, and then B also has to be so you can't write that. Uh, it's a subset, it's, so it's dominated by that. So you're, uh, it's the same level, so the levels are equal. And then because the, uh, because the, the, the label matches, yeah, you could do D, yep. So B and D. The questions about that one, yeah. Uh, the categories don't match, yeah, at all. Uh, with D, there is a category match, and it's a subset. Uh, so when the write down, it's the subsetting, yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, uh, the next thing, so that was confidentiality. The next thing is the integrity model the BIBA integrity model. Um, and maybe the CICD software we just talked about needs to, to, to look at the BIBA integrity model. Um, but uh, you know what? Developers don't really want to deal with security most of the time. So I, I'm not holding my breath for, for CICD software to develop an integrity model. Actually, we're, we're coming to a point where we're going to need an integrity model for all the packages that are out there and the lat, like, I don't know about you, but like when you are importing a package and it's got 5,000 developers uh, contributing to it, you're like, do I trust all 5,000 of you? I don't even know any of you, uh, but that's basically our trust model right now. Uh, and so this is where adversaries are definitely realizing this is a weak point in modern software development. Uh, and then maybe we're gonna have to start applying this integrity model to developers. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, like, please vet this developer first before you allow them to, to make some of these changes. Uh, the BIBA integrity model is analogous to Bell and Lapidula, uh, but it applies to in, a different security goal. Um, so this ensures integrity when the roles are hierarchical and well-defined, uh, and this prevents, uh, well, protects against modification uh, from unauthorized users, and then it also does protect a little bit from unauthorized modification by authorized users, uh, an insider. Uh, and so this is commonly used in environments where you care more about integrity uh, than, than, oh, as important. You care about integrity as much as uh, confidentiality. And so that's why software development environments, even though they're not using Biba, I would say, yeah, yeah, they should probably look at this, something like this. Um, so the idea here is that subjects are not allowed to corrupt objects in a level that is higher than themselves, right? 
So this, this uh, writing up capability, you wanna be able to make sure you can write up in a way that is, uh, that's, that's not corrupting something. In the BIBA integrity model, you're like, no, there's no write up. I'm not even allowing that to guarantee integrity uh, on that side. And so the policy is that you can do a read up. I can always read sources that are higher than me in my clearance level uh, and category level, but I can't write down is the idea here. Or I mean, I can write down and read up, but I can't write up or uh, read down. Okay, so now I just confused all of you with that. Uh, it's better, it's better here in this slide, uh, hopefully. Um, so just like Bell and La Padula have the uh, simple security property and the star uh, property, you got the same thing with the BIBA uh, uh, integrity model. If you have a subject with a particular clearance level, uh, that subject should not be able to read objects with a classification that's, that's, uh, that's lower than it. And so you do not want to be corrupted by files that have lower clearance level than you, right? So if you are relying on, for example, software that is written by someone at a lower clearance level, uh, you wanna restrict that, right? Because that's how you can corrupt the, the higher level uh, software process. And you can see how this in a software development environment, you're like, oh yeah, if I have these clearance levels for developers and you're a brand new developer, <laughs> Uh, and maybe your location is in a sus place, I'd be like, yeah, you're not, you're not, I'm not going to be able to import a package from you because, uh, because of this, right? I don't want you to be able to corrupt my software. That's the idea. So no corruption from below is the simple security policy. And so you're, you're not allowing that. Uh, the controlling rights is done with the star property, which is no right up. And so again, if you have software at your at your current security level, you don't want that thing to be overwritten by someone at a lower uh, clearance level. And that's basically what this is. So you have a subject with that clearance level, and then you can't write an object uh, with that if, if your clearance level is below. Okay, so that's the analogous. So I'm going to end with this. This is like a nice graphic that shows you uh, this is Bell and La Padula on the left, and that's Biba on the right. And that's where I'll end with access control models. But just know that there's way more here, but I don't want to lose you as a class. I mean, you can still drop the class. So uh, yeah, by next week. So now that you're hopefully in the class, then we can go on to the next step. I'm going to cover aspects of the Linux command line and then its security model that are relevant that you will hopefully come across uh, later on. And I know um, I've been administering boxes, Linux boxes for a long time. And these are the things that I often use myself. And so that's, uh, um, that's kind of the motivation for this. And you know, initially there won't be a lot of security related stuff in this section, but eventually uh, I'll get to the security model uh, for Linux. Okay, so I'm gonna start with the basics. We're gonna talk first about the operating system sometimes referred to as a kernel. Uh, the kernel operates directly on the real memory resources of a machine. Uh, and this is often referred to as kernel space, kernel memory space. And the job of the kernel is to provide a set of abstractions over hardware. This is its main job. And so it provides that virtual memory abstraction where every process believes it has the entire address space, even though it doesn't. Uh, it's providing that illusion for you. That's the operating system combined with the CPU. So this is out of CS201. Uh, it's also giving you an abstraction of a virtual computer per process, right? Every process believes that it owns the entire CPU. And so this process abstraction, well, so the, the, the time slicing of the CPU along with the virtual memory abstraction gives you the process abstraction on Linux. And then it also gives you this file system abstraction over the devices underneath. So maybe it's a disk, maybe it's memory, uh, you name it. Uh, it also provides access control. So that monitor that we talked about earlier, it provides access control across not only users, 
but any of the applications uh, that users are running uh, in order to do uh, enforce security. So there are two dominant operating systems you might come across uh, in your career. Uh, the, the first set are Unix-based operating systems. So Mac OS uh, and Linux are the main ones and then Windows-based ones. Uh, so I decided this course is mostly gonna be on Linux. And the reason why it should be obvious is like Linux is eating everything. Like uh, if you, even, even Microsoft Azure, it's like the, 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 the vendor with the competing operating system runs the most Linux servers on the planet. Okay, that was the stitch. It was dumbfounding, actually, how much I mean, how much Linux is up there. And so this is basically of the cloud. It's like ninety percent of the cloud infrastructure, uh, and it's it's on all your smartphones. Like all of that stuff is a derivation of Linux, uh, and then a lot of the embedded systems. There's a whole. You you might think that yeah, it's only sixty two percent. What what else is out there? There's a whole bunch of real time operating systems for embedded devices that make up a, a lot of these. Uh, the rest of that percentage. If you, so a lot of jobs out there, a lot of enterprises are still on Windows and there's a lot of jobs out there for Windows security and Windows administration and dealing with domain controllers, which are a Windows specific security mechanism. Uh, we don't have a lot of Windows content. I actually, in academia, academia pretty much ignores Windows because it's proprietary, right? Um, but there's a little bit of Windows in the malware reverse engineering course. If you see it offered next time and you like uh, Windows, half of that class is basically Windows. Uh, and then there's a lot of training content for Windows development. So you can get these skills outside of Portland State by doing, so I had you set up the TriHackMe account. They have a whole bunch of rooms on Windows. Uh, sort of security and exploitation and those sorts of things. Uh, again, might be an invest, a good investment of your time just because there are so few people who really, like coming out of academia at least, who really have Windows skills, but there's a whole bunch of need out in industry. The drawback is they're kind of deprecating Windows, right? Like people aren't really wanting to deploy new fleets of Windows systems. Um, so it's kind of like learning COBOL. We have a COBOL class. It's like, there's great need for COBOL, but like, uh, I don't know if it actually floats your boat to write COBOL programs, um, but like that there is a need, but it, like future job prospects down the line might, I mean, you might get pigeonholed. Um, so there is that. Um, there's also offensive security training. Um, uh, the OSCP has a lot of Windows content in it. So if that, uh, if being a penetration tester is something that you want to do, one of the, the certifications to get is the OSCP and you better know your Windows stuff for the OSCP. So if that's, if that's a career path for you. Okay, so even with Linux, there's a whole bunch of Linux distributions out there and you're like, well, I can't learn each one of these things. Um, and you won't be able to, but they're mostly similar. Uh, the two in this class that we're using are both Debian based. Uh, Ubuntu and Kali Linux uh, are, are both based on Debian. Um, I should say that uh, this is only because I have the most familiarity with, with these distros. I know other people love their distros. They're like arch, uh, that's like that or nothing. Um, I've had students who be like completely resist. They, it hurts them to deploy a Ubuntu VM in my class because they know there's a better way. And I know there's there's better way for other people to do things, but like this is just out of sheer habit is what I am used to. But I do think that the common security and system administration tasks that you will learn on these two will apply. Um, they'll map, don't worry. Um, so it's, it's translatable, um, I'm pretty sure but you can correct me if you, if you find that it, it doesn't. Okay, so I'm gonna just go through some basic Linux uh, in this class. Uh, so we'll start with accounts. Uh, every user account gets a unique username and that username is mapped to a unique integer on that particular system, a UID. And moreover, when you create that user, by default on many systems, you create an associated group for that user and give it the exact same ID as a group ID. Uh, and then the next piece is that every account has to have a home directory, someplace in the file system 
that that user is able to read and write files to or has control over. Um, so that's the home directory. And then finally, a default shell. When that user logs into your system, there has to be a, a, a shell program that the user gets dropped into so that the user can execute commands. So those are the, the main things. In terms of the options for a default, default shell, every system has different shell programs installed, um, but these are the common ones you'll come across. Uh, bin shell, uh, so SH is the original Unix shell. Um, and almost no one that I know of uses that as their shell, but it's an option. It's always, it's on every system. So you're guaranteed to be able to execute that command on any Linux system you, lo you log into. Um, there is bash and that's the default for most Ubuntu systems. And this is a replacement or, or an extension of shell that's got way more features and it's called bash is born again. Uh, shell is, is, is the acronym. There are these C shell based shells that try and so in the shell, you can do a lot of programming. And so C shell allowed you to do the C style syntax in your shell programming. That's why they called it C shell. I don't know of anyone who uses this now. That used to be my main shell, but uh, yeah, they're, it just stopped getting supported. Um, so you don't see this much. Do any of you use a C shell? Anyone in this classroom know what their shells are then use C shell? Okay. Uh, the, ones, the one I use now is Z shell uh, and it's an extended version of shell. And I use this with oh my Zish is what this is called. Um, and you'll see a lot of security folks are using Z shell. So check it out. It's, this might be the most valuable piece of information you get out of this class is that you get a shell that's got a whole bunch of stuff you never thought a shell would have been able to do. So it's got, uh, and this is either good or bad, it's got your entire command history. So as soon as you type one command one time, you should never have to type that same command ever again. It will, you know how in Google Docs you start typing and then it's got that in, in you know, completion for you that you can just hit tab and it types all those words. That's what oh my Zish gives you, right? You start typing a command and then it gives you the, uh, the option and if you don't like that option, you say control R, give me something that's before that. And then like, so git clone. So I git clone maybe like 500 different repositories. And then if I do a git clone and then I do a control R, it'll just give me the list of git clone commands that I have recently accessed. And then I never have to type that whole thing again, right? Um, so that's, that's good. Um, so Z shell. And then like, I'm, I'm making no, like Z shell is open and free anyway. So I'm not like plugging it commercially and getting sponsorship money. Um, it's just some advice. Okay, so here are some basic commands. I'm just gonna go through some of these Linux commands. If you know these commands, uh, it'll be review. If not, then you'll know this functionality exists. Uh, so the first set of commands, who am I just shows the username uh, of, of the user, the current user that's executing this shell. And then the groups show the different groups that you're, you're in. So this is uh, on my system, on my desktop. Um, these are the groups I belong to, and that's my, my username. The ID uh, command not only shows the names of the users in the groups, but those actual integers associated with the different groups and the different UIDs. And this is where in the file system and in the operating system, you're not dealing with these labels, you're dealing with these integers. That's how the operating system uh, looks for access using these IDs. And so you see my UID is 3437. Uh, and then you see this group ID that got created with my account is also 3437. And then you have standard system groups and these groups will have the same ID across mo many systems. So like www data is like the web server has that been allocated a group. You used to run web servers as root, <laughs> but then it was like, well, uh, you don't want the web server to get exploited and then be able to overwrite everything else. And so they gave it a separate group for uh, its, uh, so for example, your web server that accepts uploads and then the upload uh, functionality is vulnerable. You don't want that upload to overwrite Etsy password, right? So that would be the, that's, that's kind of why the web server has its own group, uh, but it used to not be that way. And then 
uh, for penetration testers, they were sad that this got, this got changed, I guess. Uh, there is a sudo group, and we'll talk about sudo later, but that gives, you, uh, that gives me access to execute commands as a root user. Uh, and that's one of the mechanisms for controlling privilege escalation on a Linux system. Well, we'll cover that in detail uh, later. Uh, you have the password command that changes the user's password. Uh, more often than not, like if you do the password command on a Linux lab machine, it's not going to do this. It's going to actually try and change. It's actually going to tell you that passwords must be changed a different way. And the reason why that is, is that this password command just changes your local password for the machine that you're on. But when you're administering like dozens of boxes and you want them all to have the same look and feel, uh, you want that password command to update the master password that gets pushed down to all the machines every 30 minutes. And that's what that's what cat has now. Um, and so, but this is, I'm just showing you on a, if you're administering your own box, this is the command you would use to change your password. And I think this is what you'll do when you start up that Kelly VM. I'm like, yeah, please change the root password on that. Uh, this is what you'll get. Uh, and then if you don't like your shell, then you do a change shell, CHSH, and then you specify the shell that you need. Uh, and this has to be, uh, there's a file called Etsy shells. And as long as what you type in here is in that file, so bin, bin ZSH is in that Etsy shells file, then I'm allowed to change uh, my shell to that. There has to be a blessed set of, of shells on the system in order for you to change into one of those. Okay, uh, the next thing I want to talk about is just basic file net, uh, files, directories, and command basics. Uh, so one of the things with Unix uh, to compare against something like Microsoft's uh, Windows is that everything is a file that has untyped data associated with it. Uh, and so there are types of files, but the mode of access to these files is raw byte streams. Okay, so that's, that's the Unix way. Um, and so programs and data, those are just files. Directories are just files. Uh, they just happen to have special entries that list all of the other files that the, this particular directory uh, contains. In fact, you can actually edit directories using a, a text editor, and then it'll, you'll see you'll see the um, the entries are in there. Or you can do a hex dump on the on the inode that the directory has been implemented in, and then you could see the data, the entries that are in there. So everything is a file, including directories. And then you have these uh, special files called devices, and these are your interfaces to the hardware resources. So a file-like interface to all the hardware components running on your system, that's what slash dev is, uh, that's what the device uh, area is. And then uh, another kind of file that's common are links to other files. So just references to other files in the file system. Okay, so in terms of uh, specifying files and specifying paths to them, each file has a case sensitive name. So in Linux, uh, the paths and the file names are all case sensitive. And then every file has a unique path to its location. There are some special characters in file names. The first is the slash that delimits directory traversal. Uh, so the delimiter for going down into directories is the slash character. There is also this tilde character, and the tilde is shorthand for a home directory, uh, so a user home directory. When you specify file paths in Linux, uh, you can specify them in two ways. Uh, you can specify them as relative paths from your current working directory. So in this case, uh, I'm in a, a directory and I have a subdirectory called myder and in that uh, direct, uh, subdirectory I have a file. I can just say I want access to that by just giving it this name. If I want to specify the entire path uh, going all the way to this file, then I might then I would start the path with a slash and this is the absolute path. And I would say, well, this is the root of the file system and then I could go all the way down. I, uh, traverse all those directories down to file.txt. Uh, and this is what I would use if I just want to use the shorthand to get into a home directory. If I use the tilde character without a username, that defaults to whoever is running the shell, right? So in this case, assuming I'm running it as myself, a tilde slash myder uh, slash file.txt goes to my home directory and accesses that file. If someone else is on the system, 
and then does this uh, tilde Wu Chang, then they'll go to my home directory as well. If I do, if I do this, these two things are equivalent, right? Um, because if I myself am doing tilde, that defaults to me, and then this just really explicitly defaults to me. Okay, so that is uh, th those are the uh, sort of the basics for files. Uh, there are some special things with files, and there are two special files, and there are two special directories. I guess there is the dot which specifies the current working directory. And then there's dot dot, which says that's the parent directory. So those are those are two that are in every directory has a dot and a dot dot entry uh, inside of them. Uh, if you take a relative path, miter slash file dot text, this is exactly the same as saying start in the current directory dot and then go to miter file dot text. So these are equivalent. Um, what's also equivalent is that if I do a relative path that says miter slash dot dot, I go back, so I go into miter and I come back out of it, and then I go back into it and access file.txt. That's the same thing as just going into fi uh, miter file.txt. This, this, this is called directory traversal. This is a vulnerability in the web security class that comes up all the time. People traversing directories and then winning by getting SC password. Is, uh, is a very common pattern uh, in security. Okay, uh, the dot, because when you do a listing in a directory, you never wanna see dot and dot, dot. When you're like, you already know there's a dot and a dot, dot in it. So what Linux has done with a directory listing is anything that begins with a dot doesn't show up in a directory listing. Uh, and so that hides the current directory and the parent directory, and it also, hides any file that begins with a dot. The adversary knows this, right? So if the adversary is gonna install a rootkit in your file system, you can bet that it's gonna start with a dot. Because if I do an LS and there's a rootkit there, a rootkit directory there, I'm gonna be like, oh gosh, I have a rootkit. Um, so that's one of the things that uh, uh, a hidden file will, will, will do. Okay, uh, so the next thing I wanna talk about is just the directory structure of Linux. Uh, the root of the file system is just slash, slash boot. This is where your kernel image resides. And anything that's required for booting the operating system is typically in uh, slash boot. So you'll see that this, this might be a separate file system partition on, on Linux and it's sized smaller. Uh, because one of the things you don't wanna do is to overfill a partition and have it overwrite slash boot. Like if this is all a monolithic uh, file system, like if there's just one partition and then the user home directory, say I downloaded a, a movie and it just, it just overwrote like uh, the entire capacity, you don't want it to impact anything in slash boot. Uh, and so this is typically done as a separate file. Like if you do a DF, I'll talk about the DF command. You'll often see that slash boot is its own part of the disk and it's kept separate from user home directories. And that isolation is necessary for, uh, for mistakes that user, users might make. Uh, slash Etsy, this is where all of the host configuration files are on a Linux system. This is where the highly sensitive data is. Uh, and all of the system daemons, the system processes have configuration files in Etsy. And so you would want to audit slash Etsy for any changes that you might like every night. You should say, give me a diff of all the files that have changed. And hopefully there are none, because if there are some, then maybe an adversary went in there and modified a system configuration file. Uh, so that's, that's an important directory. Uh, then you have slash bin, slash sbin, slash user, and slash lib. These are kind of the system default programs and libraries that Linux will have installed. So this is where, for example, LS is the, the program, like the password program, all of the C libraries. So in CS201, uh, libc.so is typically stored in these uh, directories. Uh, and that's when you install uh, a package, like, on, like if you do an apt install, typically those programs are installed in these directories um, on the system. There is this slash var directory, and this is all variable data. 
anything that uh, changes over time is our, uh, this is the part of the file system that it's stored in. So log files are in slash var. Um, so we talked about, we had a reference monitor emitting logs uh, based on access. And so say you have some unauthorized access that's happening, you wanna log it, you typically log it into a place in slash var. The print spooler, like say I wanna print a file and the operating system needs a temporary place to put that file as it inter interacts with the printer. That's also in var spool, uh, the print spooler stuff. Um, databases are often placed in slash var uh, and other things. Uh, home directories. So typically uh, root is given a, uh, a home directory in slash root, at least on Ubuntu. Uh, and then you have some place where all the home directories are. And typically you would want your home directories in a separate partition from everything else. So that users filling up their home directory don't mess up slash var, don't mess up the system uh, commands and definitely don't mess up the booting process. Uh, that's the idea. Uh, slash temp and slash lost and found. So slash temp is a place that's writable by everyone. It's just scratch space. Uh, lost and found. Um, so stuff happens, uh, files get corrupted, uh, sectors, sectors go bad on a disk. And lost and found is a place where all of those, like if, if you do a file system check and it has a bunch of bad blocks in it and it tries to recover them, it'll recover them into this directory. This is something you'll rarely do unless you have been a system administrator for a very long time and you're dealing with file system backup and corruption and restoration. So I just wanted to put that there because uh, every file system on Linux will have this lost and found directory. This is the lost and found for the root partition, but you'll see like if, if you have these as separate partitions, you'll have a lost and found in every one of them. Okay, uh, there are two special directories that are very security sensitive. I save those to the end. The first one is slash proc. This is a virtual file system interface for all the processes that are running on the system and the kernel data. Uh, so if you're gonna poke around uh, on a system, you typically would go into slash proc and see who's got what file open, uh, which processes are listening on which ports, what connections are active, you can just get all of that stuff uh, in slash proc. Um, and then finally, you have slash dev. This is where you have the hardware device files. And so if you're an adversary and you want access to hardware, like you have root privileges, you would go into this directory to directly access stuff. Uh, you don't want to go through the front door. You'll just go through you know, the window or the back door, however you want to get access to directly, which is what slash dev is. So direct access to disks to terminals. So for example, when you log into any Linux machine, it'll allocate you a terminal device, a, a file that basically represents your, your connection, your, your IO. And that's in, in dev TTY or dev PTS, a pseudo terminal. Uh, you access to CPU information, dev CPU or CPU info, in fact, uh, raw memory, random number generator on the device. Uh, there's a special device, dev null, which basically accepts all data and then deletes it. <laughs> so that's why dev null is, is a thing. Um, so like, this is why you like get t-shirts, complaints or go to dev null. That means that you ignore them. Um, so yeah, if you get, if you get random data uh, and you wanna have no one look at it, you would send it to, to, to dev null. Um, you can get access to in dev PCI, all of the PCI devices. Right. Uh, so the video hardware, the audio hardware, you can figure out is what's on each USB port uh, using this uh, this device interface. OK, so that's the file system. Uh, the next thing I'm going to talk about is LS. So why am I teaching you LS? Well, it's very complicated, actually. LS is probably one of the most important commands to, to know how to use well. And so that's why I'm going to talk about LS and list files and directories. Um, so with most Linux commands, one of the things you can do with any command is pass it flags. And the flags are specified by a dash. Uh, later on, so initially it was just a single dash, but then later on we're like, gosh, we have way more flags than 26 letters can support, right? Like if you do a, so the dash says, give me a single letter flag. So dash A, 
you know, or dash B or dash C. But like, if you have a command that accepts more than 26 flags, well, I guess you can do the capital letters and the numbers. So then, yeah. So you have a limit to the number of flags if they're single character. So then they added the dash dash and then a descriptive word after that to specify word-based flags. Uh, and then there are some equivalents. Uh, so ls-a says list all the files in the directory, including the ones that begin with a dot. Okay, so, and we talked about how you would hide files with a dot. Well, if you wanna unhide them, you would do an ls-a. And then the equivalent, uh, the dash dash equivalent would be ls dash dash all. Okay, so here's an example. I do an ls in my current directory, it's hello.c, and I do an ls dash a, I see dot, 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 and then I see dot rootkit. And I'm like, okay, that's, I should probably go into that directory and see what, what that thing has. Uh, ls dash l, this is a long listing, and this long listing gives you a lot more information about the file itself. It shows the owner the permissions, the file type, and its size. And so the first letter in the ls-l listing is the file type. And so here's a listing, ls-al of a current working directory, and this is what you get. So you got dot and dot dot. Um, so I'm listing all the files and doing a long listing. Because these the first character is a D for dot and dot dot, that specifies a directory. It's a, it's a directory file. And then a dash uh, means that this is just a regular file. It could be a text file, it could be a binary, it could be a PDF, they'll all have the dash. What happens if you wanna know the subtype of a regular file? You're like, I actually wanna know if that thing is a JPEG or a PDF or some other, a text file, an ASCII file, a Unicode file. There is another command for that, which we'll get to later. But this is when we talk about file types in this case, this is the file systems notion of a file type, not the application notion of a file type. And so regular files are files that aren't directories basically uh, in this case. Uh, if you see a, an L as the first character, that is a symbolic link, a very specific kind of link. And we'll, we'll cover symbolic links later. But if I do an ls-l on a symlink.txt, and this is a symbolic link to another file, file.txt, then you'll see that the little l is there um, as the file type. Uh, I also have these, uh, so we said on, on Unix, everything is a file, including all the hardware. And so there are block devices and character devices, the differentiation between those two, I'm not gonna get into, but you can look up if, you, if you'd like. So if you go into dev, and you can go and you look at the structured file system at SDA1, you say, oh, this is a block device. And then uh, this is like where your file system would be. So in this case, dev SDA1 is where my root file system on Linux is. And so this is a block device because it actually has some structure. Uh, a, a character device doesn't have structure. This is just a raw stream of bytes. And so a terminal is a raw stream of bytes that I'm reading from. And I get, the, I get the data from this device character by character, not block by block. In a file system, I'm gonna ask for blocks of 4,096 bytes at a time. So that's my typical way of interfacing with the file. For the character device, this is my, my TTY, my login uh, device. So I'll get that character by character, okay. And then there are other kinds of types like a named pipe and a socket for network connection. Uh, I'm going to ignore those. Uh, you don't really, um, well, you just know that they exist if you do an ls-l and you see that. If you do an ls-d, it says if this is a directory that you're giving as an argument, don't print the contents of the directory, just print the directory information itself. So an ls-ld of dot says, give me the current working directory, give me its permissions, its owner, and, and so forth. And you can see its size and you'll see 4096, that's a huge directory. When they create directory files, they're like, well, I gotta leave room for expansion. Uh, and I, I wanna store this in, in, chunks, in chunks of data that the disk delivers me uh, back. So like 4K blocks are typically uh, what disks are optimized to deliver back. And so that's why like by default, you create a directory and it's got a particular uh, 
file. In fact, I think I might have configured this in my file system. Um, the default usually isn't isn't 4096. Actually, I think I made that the default in mine. Um, so I'm wasting a lot of data, but like I got a three terabyte disk. I think the directory, I think the I can afford a couple megabytes of extra directory uh, of a super large directory files. I think. Um, another interest, uh, another useful flag is the capital R, which is to recursively list all files from a particular directory. And so in this command, I'm saying I want to do a recursive listing of everything in my public HTML directory. Now, in this case, I don't have much in it. My public HTML has a CS491 directory. And then within the CS491 directory, I have the index.html. And so I can do an ls-lr and get both of these things uh, listed, a, a, a traversal of that. So in that rootkit example, if I did an ls-r on .rootkit, I see all the different files. Uh, ls-al is what I would want, because it's using a bunch of dots. I would do an ls-alr and then see all of the files that the rootkit has dropped into my directory. OK, uh, man, so everybody, everyone, like, we always tell you to do to, to do a man, but this is something that very few people do. In fact, I don't do this anymore, really. I just Google the, the darn thing. But uh, in the old days, uh, the definitive, well, here's the problem with Googling things. You have a man page that's very specific to your installation. Like if you Google it, like you're just gonna get whatever whatever's popular, right? And so your version of your binaries and your libraries running on your system has a very specific versioning set. This is kind of like going to like the Python, uh, read the docs for Python. And you're like, well, which version of Python? Like if I Google it and it takes me to Python 2.7 documentation, and I'm sitting there in Python 3 trying to get that Python 2.7 stuff to actually work. That's the problem of Googling things. I'm just like, this is not only for Linux man pages, this is for any software development. Gotta make sure your versions are correct. In fact, this really hurt me uh, in the blockchain class because we were using this thing called Viper and like it had like a hundred different versions and barely any of them worked. Only one of them, like only the one kind of worked. And then we we're like, well, we need that version. But students were Googling the other ones and are like, why doesn't this work on this particular version? And it's like, because you're reading the wrong documentation it actually doesn't work. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a digression. Um, so on your system, man and a keyword is all you need to, to, to look up the documentation for the command that's currently on your system. Uh, Man-K says, do a search. Uh, because sometimes you don't know the exact command you're looking for. If you do a man with a keyword, it's gonna try and do an exact match. Uh, Man-K searches a whole bunch of stuff. If you, there are eight different sections in the man pages. And uh, if you're looking for a specific section of a man page, then you would give it as a number. So for example, there are a lot of system calls that are named exactly the same as a user command. And like when I do a man of that, man open, Right, like if open is a user command and it's a open is not a user command, I need a better example. But if if you have a command that's both, if it's both a user command and a system call, well, how do I get the system call information? Well, you would have to do a man two of that name. Or if the system call and the C library function have the same name, then you would specify the section uh, specifically in with that number. Okay, uh, some more command basics. Case sensitive commands, so little ls, not capital LS. Arguments are by default separated by spaces unless you change the shell's interfile spacing environment variable, which is a sneaky thing to do that adversaries can do, but I'm just going to give you that as a preview. Um, so in this case, there are three directories I want to ls, and they're all given in arguments separated by spaces. Uh, multiple commands are allowed on the same line as long as you separate it with a semicolon. So this will both do a listing and then bring up the man pages for LS. Um, and this is useful in the web and cloud security class. There's a command injection vulnerability. This is a canonical command injection vulnerability where I parse a command and then I allow someone to just insert a semicolon to it and then um, invoke any other command along with that command. 
Um, uh, multiple commands on the same line can be done in other kinds of syntax. I'm just going to put that there as a forward reference. There are many ways to invoke multiple commands on a single line uh, that, that you should know about. Um, all of these commands support flags in the same way that ls uh, supports flags. Uh, but here's a question. What happens if an argument that you want to send to a command begins with a dash? Does anyone know? What, what would you do? Yeah, you have to escape the character. What would you escape it with? Backslash, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that, yeah, that typically works. There's other ways around this too. Um, so this happened to me once. I created a file that was named dash A. Uh, there is a double dash by itself that also says, hey, uh, Flag processing terminate after you see a double dash. So that's a special flag uh, to end command part uh, flag parsing. I don't know if the backslash works. I'd have to test the backslash, but I, yeah, not sure. Um, Cause then it would, yeah, not sure. Um, so here's, here's, a, here's an example, an LS and you get dash A. So you see it there. You just want to delete it or you want to uh, say you want to do a long listing of dash A, right? Of that file. If you do a, a long listing of dash A, what it's going to do is going to give you everything in that directory and the dash A. Uh, but you actually just wanted this file. You didn't really want these two entries. And so with the double dash, you would say, do a long listing. And then I'm going to uh, terminate the arguments here and then say, I want to list the dash A file. And then you'll see uh, that file on its own. Uh, and then if you try and do this, if you do an RM A, uh, you're like, well, that doesn't work. Uh, so I put this in there because I lost like three or four hours on this. This is before Google. Uh, yeah. So imagine trying to figure this out before Google. Uh, and then basically that's why this is in here. And so, and then before this, before this helpful, uh, uh, so someone programmed this in to RM where they give you this message uh, because it's an invalid option. I was like, hey, why don't you do this? So this is an interesting way. You say rm and then dot slash dash a, and then it knows that that thing is a file and not a flag. Uh, so that's that's what um that's why I put that there. And then finally, that actually deleted the thing. If I do an rm dash dash of dash a, then you get rid of it. So just in case you you all do the same thing I do, I think it's like I did a make dir and it was a had a dash a and make dir actually didn't have assumed that. I don't know, you can't, oh, you can pass flags to make dir. I don't know how I created it, but I did. Um, okay, so the next set of commands are basically directory navigation and, and file copying. So CD, PWD, and make dir, changing directories, figuring out what your current work, working directory is, and then making one. Um, the, the, the flag that I use with make dir most of the time is dash P, which says create the subdirectories along the path if they don't exist. So that's a, that's, that's a flag that, that is often used. And then for file handling, copying a file, removing and moving a file. Um, the dash R flag is, is typically used when you're doing a recursive copy or a recursive deletion. So that should come in handy. Uh, copying with the dash P flag is something that I've done a lot. And that's if you wanna preserve the owners, the permissions and the timestamps of all the files you're copying. Because all those files, the timestamps in particular, will get changed to the current time when you do the copy. And sometimes you actually want to see the original timestamps. You want to know which files have been changed recently. Then you would do a dash P. OK. Uh, the next set of commands, cat less strings, nano vim, and echo. Uh, I'm going to go through these quick because I'm, you probably have used all of these already. Uh, cat and less just give you access to the file contents. Less is, is uh, with the pager, allows, it, allows you to scroll forward and backward through a file, whereas cat is just gonna dump you the entire contents. Uh, strings, this is something that is used in the malware class. If you, if you have a binary and you wanna dump out all the strings in that binary, then you would use the strings command to, to basically find all of the, the, the ASCII strings that the, the binary has. You wouldn't run strings on a text file because it's just the entire file. Um, but if you want to parse a binary for any of the static strings that are in it, that's what strings is for. 
Uh, echo. Um, we're going to use echo a lot later, but it is just echoing some kind of text or some kind of variable, shell variable into standard out. Uh, touch creates an empty file if it doesn't exist. Uh, you give it a file name argument, it creates that if it doesn't exist. Or if the file does exist, it's, it modifies the timestamp on that file. Uh, so this is interesting because you can actually give touch a date and say, change the creation date of this file to be something else. So if you're an adversary and you've just installed the rootkit and somebody is running a script to say, list me all files newer than yesterday, then you're like, well, I can't be newer than yesterday. So I'm gonna change the timestamp using touch of all my files to be last year. And then that particular command, if you're a system administrator and you don't know that time can be warped like that, you will miss that rootkit in your directory. Uh, so that's, that's why I put that there. Um, not that I've ever used it in that way before, um, but yeah. And then the next thing is nano and Vim. I, I, so I love Vim and I you know, used to think people needed to learn Vim. I don't think that anymore. If you don't know Vim, just use nano. Um, these are just text, text, uh, text editors. We're at a point where we have enough disk space to like get a real editor. Not a, I mean, they're both real editors, but to get an editor that doesn't like make a, a beginner CS person want to quit, um, just use just use Nano. Don't like you don't need to be a purist or shame anyone for not using Vim uh, the way I know some people do. So <laughs> I'm happy with Nano. I'm happy with Vim. I'm happy with Nano. I'm happy with Emacs. I'm not happy with Ed, just Ed, but like I can do the other ones. Um, okay. The next thing I want to talk about is link. Uh, LN. This is going to create a link to a file. And there are two types of links in Linux. There's a hard link and a symbolic link. Uh, and the difference is really important. Uh, by default, when you use the LN command, it creates a hard link. What is a hard link? So in Linux or in Unix, every file has a unique number associated with it called an index, uh, an index node or an inode. The inode is actually a structure, but every inode has a unique integer. Uh, and so this is how the file system keeps track of files through these unique integers. And a file's inode, when you actually create a file in a directory, that inode number is added as an entry in that directory file. And this is how you can, you can point to the files that are in that directory. Okay, if you create a hard link, what happens is that inode just shows up in multiple directories, right? There's only one file, it's a hard link because it's only one, one inode on that, in that file system, but that inode can show up in multiple directories, okay? When you edit a hard link, it's like editing the original file, okay? So that's a hard link. You can also create a symbolic link. And what a symbolic link is, it's a new file that gets created and it basically has a new inode. And in that, I, uh, in that file, it's just a path to the original file. So it's a second file that gets created. So you create a symbolic link with ln-s. When I showed you that, um, that listing, that ls listing that had an l, that's a symbolic link that I showed you there, not a hard link. You had a question? So uh, those are hard links. Yeah, those are hard. Um, and I'll actually, I'll show you the command. I'll show you the commands for, for seeing this. You can see the difference between a hard link and a symbolic link using ls-i. So give me the inode. Uh, I wanna see it. Uh, and this lists for each entry that inode, the inode number. I mean, it's not gonna dump the entire inode data structure. It's just gonna give you the, the index number. Okay, so here's, here's an example. I cat a file.txt and it's got hello. I create a hard link, file.txt. I want this hard link.txt to point to file.txt. This is in the same directory. So that means this directory has two inodes that have the exact same number and point to the exact same file, but they're in that directory. The name of that one entry is hardlink.txt and the other one's file.txt. Okay, 
I also create another file in that directory, a symbolic link called symlink.txt that points to the same file. Now, if I cat the hardlink.txt, same file, cat symlink.txt, same file. All right, so that's where I'm going to start. If I do an ls i, uh, you see the very first entry is the inode number. And the first two files were, so hardlink.txt has got the exact same inode. So this is two entries in that same directory, both pointing to the same inode. The third column says, is a reference count number. How many directories does this inode appear in? Or how many places does this inode appear in the directory system? And this is a reference count. And so because there are two entries here, and this, assuming this is the only place this file exists, this reference number is two, okay? Uh, the symbolic link, and we see this L here because it's symbolic. This is now a new file that just points, the path points to file.txt. Yeah. Yeah. And so there are two sets here. You're like, okay, you get access to that link, symbolic link. But when you actually access file.txt, I have to look at file.txt permissions. Uh, and so I want to, this is the last thing on a run. I have one minute left. So I really want to finish. If I cat the hard link.txt, oh, so I, here I rename the file to something else. Uh, but because the inode changes, uh, doesn't change, I can cat hardlink.txt and I can still get that file, right? So the name changed of the original file, but because this is pointing to the inode, both of these files are still the same. It's just the naming is different. Okay. Uh, if I cat the symlink.txt, it's gone, right? This thing no longer exists, this mapping. And so this is why that thing breaks, right? The file is still there. But because the name changed, this doesn't work anymore. It, it like file.txt is no longer there. If I remove the renamed file and I cat hardlink.txt, this should also still work, right? The, you, the reference count should go down by one, but the file is still there. The original uh, inode is still there. Uh, and so you'll see when you cat this, file is still there. Uh, if you do an ls-i on it, you'll see the reference count goes from two to one. When the reference count goes to zero, then you can actually garbage collect, right? Those blocks are no longer accessible in the file system, delete. And then the file system will delete it when the reference count goes to zero, which is basically what programming languages do to memory. 